Have you ever noticed a human proclivity towards selfishness? I was thinking about a book I read quite a few years ago when it came out. Richard Dawkins wrote The, the Selfishness or Selfish Gene. It was controversial, but he suggested that selfishness is in our genes. It's how we survive. Um, maybe, maybe not. But I certainly know I can be selfish. And I'm guessing you've been selfish at some point or another. And yet, be that as it may, I'm going to confess, I don't know that I've ever seen a surge of selfishness like I have in the last few years. It just seems that selfishness is on the rise in my experience. From what I'm seeing, what I'm reading, what I encounter, and whether it's the roads or the grocery stores, selfishness is the other infection that is making its way around. Whether it is, now I'm going to say, I know politicians always have lied, right, to hold on to power, but I've never heard so many bald-faced lies and so many people lying and manipulating in order to hold on to power and control. And people unwilling, many people, to do the simplest things in a global pandemic and health crisis to care for each other. And an and extreme example that I saw, that maybe you saw it too, because the video went viral, a woman from Arizona, uh, but was in Nebraska at a grocery store, and there were some people she encountered who were wearing masks in the grocery store. She was not. And she was taunting them, and they caught it on video. And not just taunting them, she starts to cough at them, pretending she has allergies, just to bully them. A grown woman. I have some feelings about this stuff. Maybe you do too. And I think some of the feeling that I have comes not just from the ways that people are willing to put each other at risk in actions of selfishness, but also there's a sense, I'm just going to say it, of betrayal. Because I was taught explicitly by the people who came before me, grandparents, parents, schools, that what it meant to be a good citizen, so I'm not even talking about Jesus' church at the moment, just what it meant to be a good citizen is you watched out for each other is that you took care of people who were vulnerable and in need, and that you would, if necessary, sacrifice for the greater good. And we were even given citizenship awards in schools if you exhibited that behavior. Where did that go? And now to church Christian, Jesus is very not about selfishness. And so one might expect that those who claim to be Jesus' followers, who call themselves Christians, that, that we be on the forefront of not being selfish. And certainly there are people who are living into not selfishness. But I also think about all the self-identified Christians who are sometimes at the forefront of selfishness, acting in selfish ways. And I remember in the heart of the pandemic over a year ago, when almost everything was closed down and no one had vaccines, how there was a church I'd drive by all the time that said, we have in-person worship. Oh, so I, though, like, I wonder how they're doing that. So I called. What do I need to do? Oh, well, I know there's this mask mandate. You don't really need to do it. Just come on in. And you show up with a mask on, but then you take them off, and then we just will sing because it's our right to do so. And I remember my mind went, Phew. Because it's here in this community, the same community where some of those people might work in the nursing home, where I have church members who are vulnerable. What would Jesus do? Well, Jesus lets us know. Because Jesus recognizes that we've got that selfishness going on in us. It's part of the fabric of humanity. So he addresses it. And we heard him acknowledge, yep, we can do selfish things. We can only look out for ourselves Try to be number one. The one who dies with the most toys wins, right? We all know those messages. He said, but you can gain the whole world, but in that you lose your soul. You can gain the whole world, but you lose your soul. Now, when Jesus says lose your soul, he's not talking about where you go when you die. The soul that Jesus is talking about in the Hebrew tradition is the seat of the image of God in you. 
It is the divine light alive in you. It is the center. Your soul is the center of what is compassionate and creative and beautiful and just and good and hopeful. And Jesus says, you can go ahead and be selfish, but then you lose that. You lose your soul. And Jesus is not just speaking theoretically or philosophically. This is his lived experience. As we see in the story, he's talking with his disciples where he is seeking to embody a soulful way of being. He's teaching people how to live as children of God instead of spoiled brats. This is what Jesus is embodying. This is what he's living. He's teaching people how to access and be attuned with the Spirit, with their souls, and live that in the world. And he says, it's at hand. It's available. We can do it. It'll change everything for the better. But he notices that as he's living this, he says, but that the people who are supposed to know better are willing to hand him over for beating, execution, but they're willing to hand him over. The image, the idea is that at hand is what is soulful. At hand is the possibility of living as the beloved children of God. At hand is what is bright and beautiful and creative, and that people will hand that over in order to grab a hold of something less in order to grab a hold of what they think will help them survive or just make it or get ahead of others. The, the, the simple visual is that Jesus is painting is that we will hand over what would bring the fullness of life to us in order to grab onto what will keep us from the fullness of life. I'll say that again. We hand over what would bring the fullness of life to us in order to grab a hold of what would keep us from the fullness of life. And Jesus himself, he knows the, the same whether it's the genetics or the proclivities or the culture, but he knows about selfishness. He knows about self-preservation. So he knows that under threat and when things are hard, we're likely to just try to, you know, take care of only ourselves. But he won't do it that way. He models a different way, even as he's under threat. He keeps opening himself to God's spirit. He refuses to take control. He refuses to engage in violence. He refuses to be selfish, and he stays in the spirit, and he lives soulfully. He lives as a child of God instead of a spoiled child. This is what he keeps doing again and again, and he teaches it to his disciples, and he talks about that it's not easy, that there is sacrifice and struggle. You, you can suffer when you live this way, but it's the best life in us and the best life for the world. And did you catch, though, the disciples, their response to Jesus' little teaching about that? They didn't say, oh, well, my goodness, Jesus, how can we be helpful to you in this? Or, Jesus, how can we play a part in what will be healing and good? Nope. We hear they're fighting about who's the greatest. They grab a hold of that selfishness. Which one of us, when, when he's gone, who's going to be in charge? That's where their minds and hearts go. Even the closest people to him because there's a learning curve. So why would people, why would we, when we know better, let's say, why would we live in the ways that are selfish? When we know the goodness of living and embodying as children of God, why would we want to act like spoiled children? Well, the, the old, I call it the old school theological answer is sin. But I don't mean sin maybe the ways that some of us were taught it, that sin, you might hear that and like, oh, I'm evil, or you're supposed to feel ashamed or guilty or just your bad actions. The biblical understandings of sin aren't really about that. Sin, in the Hebrew, there's two words that get translated as sin. One means to miss the mark. The other means to wander off the path. Doesn't sound evil, right? And the mark or the path is about unity with God. We could say that sin, from this biblical perspective, is simply about experiencing ourselves as separate from God. Sin is an experience of separation from God. And in all the ways that might happen and that that's the way we perceive things, well, then it feels like we're on our own here. Jesus uses the language in John's gospel of being orphaned. So if we feel like we're on our own and it's all up to us, well, then got to take care of myself, right? Got to do it myself. Got to stay in charge, stay in control, keep managing, and I got to be greater than other people or I'm not going to make it in this world. If I'm going to be successful, if I'm going to have the life, the dream, i got to be greater than other people. So I might have to climb over other people and push and shove. And so in all of that, well, when we're in competition with our neighbors, it's hard to really love our neighbors, let alone getting around to loving the stranger or the enemy like Jesus teaches us. 
And James, in the letter that, that Pastor John read, he's really talking about the same idea, that he's recognizing that in the ways we feel separated or disconnected inside ourselves from who we really are as God's beloved, when we're, might say, divorced from our own souls, what well, sets up a battle inside of us, and then that battle gets lived out outside of us. And so there's wars and quarrels and selfishness and pushing and shoving and well, pretty much, you know, open your newspaper or look at your phone, not right now, but right away, we read all the stories. It's all about that. And Jesus awakens us to that reality in the ways that we live, not that we feel ashamed or guilty, but because he believes we can choose differently. That there may be a proclivity to selfishness. Maybe there's even a selfish gene, and that can help us survive, but we're not here just to survive. We're here to thrive. We're here to create to offer what is beautiful and bright and loving and hopeful. And he says, so we can do that. So be aware of the ways that we might trend toward the selfishness and act like spoiled children. But he says, the truth is you are the children of God. The very image of God is alive in you. And you can access that every moment, every breath, every day. And I think about, we might say, well, how do I even do that? Where does that start? And it can start even with how we might pray could just be as simple as in a daily practice of something like, okay, God, I don't want to be that spoiled child that I just saw in the video, right? The, the grown person who's not acting like a grown person. I don't want to be the person that creates fear or takes life away or lies or just tries to be greater than everyone else for my own benefit. So God, help me let go of that instead of let going, letting go of my soul and help me embrace you. Help me hear how you're still speaking. Help me hear it in the silences, in conversations with other people, around the table with people that matter, and let's have meaningful conversations and and, in the ways that we study and grow and stretch and move and take in the beauty of the world. Help me receive the truth that I am beloved and belong and to live from that place. Well, how do we know if we're doing it? I mean, if there's a proclivity towards selfishness, well, then we probably would be pretty good at self-deception around that. I'm not being selfish. So Jesus offers bountiful examples or ways to look at how are we measuring up? Are we living in the fullness of soulfulness or selfishness? And in the story today, the example he uses is he puts a small child in their midst. It's like, here's a good barometer. And also be aware, in that time and place, Of course, parents love their children, but there was high infant mortality rates. You had lots of kids, and most people lived below what we'd call the poverty level. So societally, children were much more liability than asset. And so there was a devaluing that may seem alien to us, at least philosophically, that could be at work. So that's one of the reasons he uses a young child. And we, though, could also say anyone who's vulnerable anyone who you think can't pay you back. Put that person in your midst. How do you treat them? How do you welcome them? How do you love them? He's saying, you want to know, are you soulful or selfish? Pay attention to that. So let's do it. Barometer of children. You can think about it in your own personal life. How do you attend to or deal with them? Or really, you can, if it's helpful, anyone vulnerable. Anyone who's not going to pay you back. Someone who can't invite you back for dinner, for example and return the hospitality. But at the level of society, at the level of neighborhoods, and as individuals in our churches. So I think societally, how are we welcoming and loving children? Every time there's another Sandy Hook, and we have way too many, I wonder. So let's take our measurements, our barometric pressure, the temperature, around how do we care for children in the face of those things. Or on the front page, and it's a huge, long story, little plus for local journalism. It's still good that we have local papers with reporters who dig in. But in today's Arizona Daily Star, in a society and time where if, if you don't have two incomes in Tucson and you're working in the service industry, and the odds are you are, then you're not going to be able to pay any rent. But in order to have the two incomes, you're going to have to have child care, and the system is showing that most people can't afford child care. So what are you going to do? It's just this, ah. So how are the children being cared for? Or here we are, global pandemic. 
and I had a neighbor child talking to me, a kindergartner, who says that the grown-ups are using them as pawns. A kindergartner sees this. How is this child in a pandemic feeling welcomed and loved and safe? And, of course, it works in churches. I remember there was this church I served that had the big high steeple, seated 500 people in the sanctuary, and it was known in its community as the the church where, at least in the old days, the important people worshipped there. That was its reputation. And that church, like I'll say a lot of congregational UCC churches, on paper was against segregation, except when it came to children. Children were not really supposed to be in the spaces where the adults were. And the systems and structures were put together so that would happen. And like all segregational policies, people would give you the good arguments about why that was better for everybody. So I I mentioned that, though, to say there weren't many times that children were in the sanctuary. But in that church, if a child was in the sanctuary doing normal child things, you know, breathing, wiggling, maybe crying here or there, making a noise. In that church, there was furrowed brows and arms tied across the chests and people very distressed. And there would be people who would march up to the, whoever they thought they needed to march up to and complain about the noisy child in the worship service. And it struck me, who's more like a spoiled child in that story? And then, though, I want to tell you, in another UCC church I served, these are all UCC churches, similar, I'll call it demographics, level of education, but in this other church, they were intentional about pondering, praying, and working to how do we include all ages in what we're doing, including worship. And in that church, where children were more often in the worship space, and children made normal children noises and did normal children things, in that church, well, the grandparents in the pew behind were like, ooh, could you, could you go, right? and make the, 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 the kind faces and try to help the parent and were part of the community and laugh when the children would laugh. And if the child or the baby was just crying a lot and that poor bedraggled mother who was just trying to worship, well, some of those people might, with permission, scoop that child up and walk back and forth in the back of the sanctuary or sit in the rocking chair that they didn't put in a separate cry room but in the sanctuary where you could rock the child there and still be part of what was happening. So in the first church, they had a very quiet sanctuary, but it seemed like maybe they lost some of their soul. And in the other church, they're willing to let go and let things be messy or out of control, but there was a lot of soul there. And I want to affirm ways, I mean, I I don't have the normal measures, you know, pandemic. I only got to be in person with you for several months before everything started to shut down. But what I see in this faith community is, is ways that people are seeking to be intentional in welcoming the children and the vulnerable. Uh, So whether it's in the kind of programming and staffing, but also the amazing ministry this church has in partnership with the Keeling School on so many levels. And ministries to vulnerable folks coming across the border who need help and assistance. Ways that people are trying to advocate for justice for people who are on the margins or on the outside. That is some soulful work. That is child of God stuff. Every day, Jesus reminds us we have the choice. Spoiled child, child of God. Selfish, soulful. He lets us know what's the better way for us and for the world. Let's keep walking with Christ and live it. Amen.